Hi everyone, my name is Kat Savage and I'm a clinical hypnotherapist and well-being expert working in the creative arts sector. In my line of work, I get to meet some amazing, colourful people, from actors to artists, people who live their lives by their own rules, fueled by passion and determination to bring their unique talents into the world. I wanted to discover what it took for people to leave the usual nine to five and hop on a dream, to capture their bravest moments and share these meaningful conversations with you, so that together we can explore the ideas, emotions and moments that could potentially change our lives too. The Brave Moment podcast starts now, in the middle of the COVID pandemic, probably the bravest moment not only for my guests, but for the whole world. So let's keep talking, have some fun, and enjoy the show. This week on the show, we talk to artist and poet Becky Nuttall about her extraordinary work. Focusing on female empowerment and the journey from girl to womanhood, Becky takes us through her time growing up under the shroud of religion, becoming a mother and reclaiming her identity through her art in her midlife. We also get to hear some of her wonderful poetry. It gives me great pleasure to introduce you to the embodiment of feminine mystique herself, the wonderful Becky Nuttall. Hello, Becky, and welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Lovely to be here. <laughs> I have to explain to our listeners, we are doing this over Zencast today. So it's a new experience for both me and my guest. Um, but needless to say, I still want to know what your surroundings are like, Becky. So would you like to describe your artistic studio to everybody? Oh, certainly. I'm not sitting it in it at the moment. I'm sitting in the room where I'm currently working from home. <laughs> so I'm sitting in my um, office. But um, I live in, the, I'm really lucky to live in quite a big house. So I've got an attic, which is my studio. But I have three children and the last one, um, when um, he left home, I finally got the attic. <laughs> <laughs> it was the children's space <laughs> for many a year and they would not let me have it no matter how hard <laughs> I tried to wrestle it off and, so have you reclaimed that space? Well, I reclaimed it. I like re reclaimed the corner. And my, so actually, it took years for my husband to allow me to, <laughs> to claim the attic. And I would only say within the last um, year have I actually it, – it's like in two halves. So there's one because it's like in a roof space. So then, and there's the, the attic stairs go up the middle. And he let me have one half. He said, yeah, you can do what you like over there. Which, and, I, and after I said, you know, I really need you. <laughs> got the elbow room. Can I have the bit over there? And he was um, sort of, no, not, no, you can't. <laughs> uh, but he never used it. And I very, very <laughs> slowly crept all my stuff over that side of the attic. So I can now say I have a studio in the attic and it is mine. <laughs> I'm, I'm uh, imagining this wild woman just shoved up in the attic and all the men running around downstairs. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was a bit like that. It was like that. I did actually try to, um, to, to to commandeer one of the kids' bedrooms even after they left home, but they got a bit, you know what, kids are like, they get very territorial. And when they come back, they say, why are you using my bedroom? It's not your bedroom. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> talking of children, um, I'd like to take you back in time to when you were a child. Can you describe yourself as you were a child? Um, I can describe what I thought I was like, and then I can describe how other people <laughs> thought I was like. <laughs> Go for it. I I was um, I was quite an academic child, um, and I was always creative, um, and I was always encouraged to be creative. But I think a lot of people would have said at times I was a pain in the neck, show off, and horribly precocious. <laughs> <laughs> but I could hold my own with, with, with adults. We were brought up with, um, uh, you know, expected, going back a bit in the day, you know, you expected, you know, when, when relations came and what have you, to be able to um, uh, talk to adults and behave yourself. So I was, um, I was quite, I think I was quite, let me say I was quite an entertaining child. <laughs> <laughs> and I had three sisters. I've got three sisters. 
And I think my two elder sisters found me a pain in the neck. So, yeah, yeah. But my younger sister adored me, so that was all right. <laughs> Do you reckon you were the most creative out of all the sisters or did you all have your thing? Um, I think I was encouraged to believe I was the most creative one. And, and by what I actually did, I was the most creative one. Um, and I was encouraged very, a very young age to be creative. And I remember at nine um, saying to my parents I wanted to go to art school and they took it really seriously and looked at how I could do that. Even at nine years old, they were sort of planning, how, you know, that that's what I wanted to do. Um, but my sisters, other sisters are amazingly creative, but they just do it in different ways. And I don't think that was recognised, and I think that's a problem in big families. You know, one child might stand out as being something in particular, but actually we were all equally as creative. That's such a wise thing to say. And and from a big family myself, um, I can absolutely agree with that. Um, taking you taking you up into your teenage years, who were your teen idols, do you think, and how did they inspire you? <laughs> How long have you got? Um, <laughs> I was a uh, I, I was a teenager in nineteen seventies. Oh, beautiful! Jealous. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It couldn't have been a better time. Absolutely, um, and I am mining that <laughs> that seam um, creatively. But um, t- t- teen eyes, it, it would be obviously music, um, and I was very um, well. I started off really loving folk music. I was quite into folk music, um, Simon Garfunkel, that sort of um, music when I was quite young, because I, cause I just loved the lyrics and the, uh, and the and the music. But then I discovered glam rock, <laughs> and then I became an art school rock, and then I became an absolutely absolute devotee of David Bowie. And I do remember at school you you fell into two camps. You were I because glam rock did actually cover quite a myriad of. Um, of um, musicians and I um, and you're either like uh, T-Rex, Mark Bolan, Deb Bowie, um, that camp, that sort of art, art school camp or you were the Bay City Rollers and Sweet and Slade and it was quite a standoff because I would not have that but the Sweet or Bay City Rollers, <laughs> <laughs> they were not my thing but, <laughs> but it, so, it was, um, so it was music um, very much were the my my idols anything coming out of that uh, early 1970s and you've kept a bit of that in your uh, in your personality <laughs> haven't you I, have. <laughs> I know that you've got red hair just like me and it's cut in a very David Bowie-esque way <laughs> it is I first cut my hair in a David Bowie-esque way when I was about 14 because because his timeline absolutely mirrors my sort of timeline you know in terms of being a young you know like 13, 14 when I first um, heard of him when he first came on the scene and I had quite long I had long long brown brown hair um, and I cut the t- <laughs> the top into a tufty little David Bowie thing and uh, and I cut the fringe into a tufty little David Bowie thing but the rest was really long and brown and it wasn't a mullet I'm not going there it wasn't a mullet <laughs> um, and, my, and my, my mother was absolutely furious absolutely furious <laughs> but I didn't care <laughs> doesn't sound like an artist at all (laughs) so can you remember the first time you became aware of your artistic gift or did someone tell you you had that talent well like I said my my family was creative my dad was an artist and a writer and my maternal grandfather was a writer and uh, so we just grew up with that really in our genes um so I don't think I ever I don't think there would ever be a first time um, but it was really weird because I was at a, I went to a convent school, although we weren't Catholics. Did you? Yes. And my parents were of that generation where they thought if you paid for an education, you were getting a good education, which wasn't true. Um, <laughs> and, um, and they, and I remember, I do remember painting something at school and they all were absolutely shocked that I, that I could paint, uh, and I could draw because I don't think they, rated me very highly academically and I remember being quite insulted by that really and I thought it was quite because they knew they knew my background they knew who my father was and they knew the context of my life um, but they'd never really taken it on board that actually I might be quite good at art and there was a girl in that school who was very good at art but you, you're only allowed 
one good artist in that school. Oh, really? <laughs> it's so weird, isn't it? So, um, so I think um, I think I or I think I always found it hard to get it accepted from certain people that I was good at art. But there were always people, but n- not at school. Although I did go to art school. So, I mean, you mentioned your dad in that comment. Tell us a little bit about him. So he um, he was a writer and, a, and a, um, an artist. So he 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 left art school. He went to Bristol School of Art, and he left art school and uh, worked in the Bristol Old Vic set um, scenery for the children's theatre. Mm-hmm. And then he moved. He and he, and he met my mum. And they came down here and they opened pottery in High Brixham. <laughs> really great stuff, you know, mid-century pottery. Really, mm. really good, good stuff. And uh, that, but he, what he was doing was he was he was trying to save enough money up to become a full-time professional writer, and it, which he did. He then got work um, accepted, got an agent, got work, work accepted on the BBC. So he, so from a, I, I never really knew him as anything other than a writer. He, he was a founder member of the Devon Guild of Craftsmen, so he was around that era when they founded the Devon Guild of Craftsmen. Um, so he was quite sort of um, very into the arts down here at that period of time, which was like 1950s, early 60s. Um, and then he, like I say, he, he became a writer. Wow, now we know where you get all your gifts from. <laughs> Well, I'd like to credit him with 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 with, with some of them. I think, um, but there were other artists in my family. He wasn't the only. He wasn't the only writer for sure. Mm. So you mentioned that you went to a convent, and I've I've looked at some of your work, and I can see that actually religion plays quite a big sort of inspirational part in some of it. What other things inspire your subject matter? Well, I guess. Um, I remember my daughter saying to me, "Mum, you've got a story, and you ought to be telling that story." Um, and and the story is that you were uh, came from a very artistic background, but you were but you were sent to a convent, and your parent your parents weren't even religious. Um, so it was all a bit it's all a bit weird. And and I was very inspired by the iconography in in the school, um, and I and I, I just became increasingly um, interested in how all those elements that I grew up with in a time where things were very authoritarian and you were expected to do what you were told and to, to respect what people told you to respect and how that particularly impacted on girls of my generation in the 1960s, 1970s who started to kick back from that sort of thing. So I, 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 it's sort of me looking at the sacred and the profane, sort of religious piety in art and how that impacts on pop, popular culture and conformity, and 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 how that imp- impacts on adolescent females. So that's been a sort of backstory to most of my. That's why there will be a lot of schoolgirls in my art, and a lot of religious iconography, it, which isn't, um, which is sceptical, not, um, <laughs> not because I'm religious, because I'm not. <laughs> I think a lot of um, creatives grapple with with religion, don't they? <laughs> yeah, they do. Well, they do. They do. <laughs> so obviously, um, you know, you've mentioned that you know school children and stuff come up through your art, and especially looking at at young female uh, adolescents coming into that very very influential stage. So when you're creating a poem or a painting, who do you think is at work? Do you think it's your inner child, or is it? Or is it more of an adult head that takes over the paintbrush or the pen? I think what we do is we just use elements um, of of ourselves that 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 have been quite key in our in our life experience growing up and and, and transfer those. I don't really have an an inner child. I think I grew out of my. I had imaginary friends when I was. Did you? Little. So did I. <laughs> no, well, there you go. There. So I had. The, so I had this really real internal life. And I think when you think, well, you know, if you're in a big family, you do. Some of those children will have a really powerful internal life going on, and their family won't even know about. And no, which is the point, really, isn't it? You, there's some sort of control over. Um, over, uh, over what's happening, what's happening around you, um, and I guess I guess I, obviously I will transfer all those bits into my art and my poetry. But I am not, um, I'm not, I'm, I, 
I don't think I've still got that much of an inner child. Mm. <laughs> I think I've got just enough to, to, to somebody you know pokes me now and again. Remember, remember. <laughs> but um, no, I think it's just uh, transferring experiences. Mm. So this is a question that I love to ask all artists because I, I experienced it myself. When you're working, do you feel like it's coming from you? Or do you think it's like another source working through you? Because there was a, an interesting um, thing that I read and it was in Elizabeth Gilbert's book, Big Magic. And uh, she mentions in this book that ideas are almost circling around your head and they'll choose the right artistic vessel and they'll pop into, into their mind or their memory. And if the artist doesn't capture it there and then, then it moves on and finds another vessel. So do you feel like your art, when you're doing it, uh, is coming from that other extra source or is it definitely something very grounded and something rooted in you? It, oh, God, I could talk about that forever. Um, it's, I, you know, it is, a sort of, it is a sort of alchemy, isn't it? It really is a sort of alchemy. And it's sometimes, you know, when I'm cre- creating something or I've finished something, I think, oh, that's good. And then I think, oh, heavens, how am I ever going to recreate something <laughs> again? It, it, it is weird. It is weird. And it, it but it's really hard. It's hard work and practice. You know, it really is grounded in hard work and practice. You aren't going to get any better unless you put the hard work in. But it's, I, I, I'm always quite, um, really surprised by how I will have an idea. And then I'll open a book or do a bit of re- research and that, and how that idea that something will pop up from somewhere else and feed that idea and you think, blimey, you know, and then it just expands into this whole different thing that I had no idea was going to happen. So it, I, there, there is some sort of alchemy going on out there. But I do think, but I do think it's down to hard work because you have to do, you have to find this stuff. You have to look for it. You have to be open to it and you have to join the dots and then, and then you have to do the hard work of producing it. And I'm a terrible one. I used to be a terrible one and I told my daughter because she was, <laughs> She was doing this just because you just because you've thought about it doesn't mean you've done it. Um, so you can sit there all day with your head in the clouds thinking about stuff, and that and they get really excited about stuff. And then, it, but you haven't created it; you've just thought about it. So now you've got to do the hard work. You've got to create it, which is where, where the hard work comes in for me. <laughs> so, do you think then, on you know, giving us that piece of advice, do you think there is such a thing as bad art, or do you think that all art is valid if it comes to the surface and actually makes it out into the world? Now, that's going to depend on what on what you want to do with the art, doesn't it? Um, if you, if if you I, no, I don't think there's anything as bad or anything um, such thing as bad art. Because it always comes from a, from a good place, and art is a language, and 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 if and it's just another way of expressing yourself. So if somebody feels that the only way they can express some feeling or some experience is by putting it down through the medium of colour and images, well, that's not bad art, is it? That that'd be quite insulting to the person who's doing it. It it's get, it it's when it gets to the point that you're being judged, isn't it? Where where you're trying to put it on a on the open market, or you're trying um or that's where the judgment comes in and that's really hard and that is the really really hard hard bit so no I don't think there's anything as bad art yeah and I get quite cross when um when people's efforts are are dismissed publicly I mean we all do it when we go around an art gallery don't we? <laughs> I wish I could do that. um but um but but I would never I would never say it to somebody's face mm. and I think that's where art criticism and art critics um well it's a market isn't it it's a it's a financial market Yeah, it's such a shame. And and it's something that I feel very passionately about myself, because obviously, a lot of people that listen to this podcast or anything else, uh, in terms of creativity, they might just be starting out. And a lot of people will suffer with that imposter syndrome, which artists, they they almost call it a best friend at some point. don't they? We always go through that, that motion of, oh, no, this isn't good. And all the rest of it, I'm not worthy of it. And, and, and sometimes that's strong enough for people not to start at all. So I mean, even now with all of your professional you know accolades do you still suffer with imposter syndrome and if you do how do you deal with it I don't suffer particularly with imposter syndrome probably because like I said about my childhood and growing up um, I was everything was validated and my father was friends with very very good artists very good artists and they always encouraged me and they were lovely 
really lovely and 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 they and they um and I thought that's so if you if you, and I was really lucky in that but really lucky in that and and they just said oh just go for it Becky you know just keep keep trying keep keep doing it and and now I have people still who I um, look up to who will say just you know just keep um just keep plugging away I think I think I think it comes back to that being judged when when you put your when you put yourself forward to being judged by whatever you know if you submit yourself to a an open exhibition you know you have to go through the submission stuff and you're, and you're not successful yes and then you'll think well what the heck are they looking for what are they looking for they must you know why aren't they accepting my work and and, and you will get a little dip in confidence then uh, but they don't take it personally big people don't know you <laughs> so do you have a favorite piece or collection and why is it special to you is that my own stuff or out of my own work that is your own stuff my own yeah. stuff uh, um i've got um a thing i i i tend to go by themes so i try and um I have a theme, something that I get a bit obsessed with, and then I would do work relating to that. Uh, and one of the major themes is art of the school, um, which is all the stuff influenced by growing, you know, being educated in a convent, all that iconography that you were talking about, uh, the adolescent um, impact of adolescent on 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 your on all that the, all that influence. I do. I'm I'm very fond of the pictures in there. Um, I am currently working on another theme, which is more around when we, um, before we became women, we were girls, and that's exploring around um, those th th those influences again, but more around the music and art that uh, influenced me rather than the religious stuff. I can't wait to see that collection. <laughs> so obviously you do write poetry as well. When did that journey begin? And can you remember what your first poem was about? <laughs> Well, I think um, but my dad said to me that he thought I was a poet before I was an artist, which is interesting. But then I think that's probably because all children are artists, aren't they? You know, all children do express themselves um, through um, drawings and painting. So that's really not unusual. But I think it is quite unusual to have a young child writing poetry. And, um, and I wrote poetry feverishly. I've got it and I've still got it all. And it's, um, I just wrote all the time, just wrote poetry. And I thought poetically. And, and I think that um, if you talk to poets and if you talk to maybe writers who write in a certain way, playwrights, in my view, I bet they'll say, yeah, well, I always thought like that. I had this internal voice. I was always going, I was always, there was always a dialogue going in my head. And I always thought poetically. I didn't speak poetically. <laughs> God, that would be potential. <laughs> but I did, um, but I did. But I did think poetically. I transferred what I saw into a sort of poetic language from quite a young age. And I was the only person I know who did that as a child. None of my friends did it. None of my friends wrote poetry. Um, so I always wrote it, but I do remember, and of course my parents were really open to that and were quite, and I would be quite impressed by it as well, you know, that I, I was quite a dedicated little poet. And I would go into their bedroom and, in the morning and stand at the end of their bed and proclaim these poems at them. Poor things. <laughs> <laughs> well, God, here she comes again. <laughs> Disturbing their Sunday morning. So um, I wrote a piece at school that the, um, again, that I, I got quite a lot of praise for, 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 for it. Um, and again, in a quite a surprised way. And, um, and that, um, I can't remember that was, um, about the rain, pitter patter goes the rain because <laughs> it falls against my window pane. So, right, man. And then, but I think the one I wrote before that was um, Fuzzy Wuzzy was a bear and Fuzzy Wuzzy had no hair. <laughs> and I could have, I must have been about, <laughs> and he would wander everywhere. And I can't remember the rest of it, um, but it, but I have got it. But I wrote it, in, I wrote it in yellow um, biro, and it faded. Um, so, but I could have been, I must have been quite young to to written something like that, eight or nine or something. That's fantastic. I love it. I love that you still have all of your poetry as well. That's wonderful. I do. I do. I have it. 
Yeah, I do. So yeah. what do you consider <laughs> to be your favourite poem? Because it would be lovely if you would read it for us. I, I guess I'd have to say the poem that my daughter asked me to write, compose for her wedding. She got married that, uh, five years ago. And she asked me to write a poem, for, and I was absolutely, oh, my goodness, and, and, the, and to read it as well. And every, I, what was lovely was that everybody, she held it together at her wedding up to that moment, <laughs> and she didn't know what it was. It was a complete surprise. And when I read it, she cried. and she, <laughs> So that was rather nice. So it's called um, Life Saving. So would you like me to read it? I would love you to read it. Okay. <laughs> but. Life saving. Do you know you saved my life? You saved my life. By degrees and piece by piece, you stilled the faltering part of me, joined us in perfect symmetry to fit together perfectly. Do you know by doing that, you saved my life? Do you know you saved my life? You saved my life. You gave me hope and air to breathe. Deep within me, there were stars. You gave them light and kissed each one, pinned them on my beating heart, life boys on my drifting raft, towing all the good in me. Did you know when you did that, you saved my life? Such sweetness resurrecting me, constellations, planets, galaxies holding me. All satellites marked and named, surrounding and reminding me, you saved my life. Oh, that is absolutely beautiful. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you so much for making me cry. I'm glad that this isn't a visual recording today. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that's absolutely beautiful. I I wrote that, obviously. I wrote it, obviously, with her, her in mind, but she did. She did save my life um, by, I, I got married quite young and I, well, very young and I'm still married and, um, and I had her quite young, I was only 20, but she absolutely anchored me after a time of, you know, some quite difficult times before I got married and she really did, having, having a child absolutely anchored me. So um, she did save, save my life, she really did bring out the best of me and then she met her, um, her partner and um, he'd work best in her, and then my other children, and then my husband, of course, because he, 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 by meeting him. And I just thought, you know, when I write poetry, I, tr- I try to, I try to make it very personal, obviously, and about, but then bring in other people's lives and other people's experiences, and that sort of more universal. Mm. That's why I hope people, how people connect to it anyway. Why do you think that poetry is so cathartic, especially for women? Well, I suppose it's because women have a bit of an inner life, don't they? You know, and um, and we do internalise a, a lot. And I don't think we were particularly, historically, women weren't encouraged to write that sort of poetry, that confessional poetry, you know, Sylvia, Sylvia Plath and Anne Sexton um, type poetry, Elizabeth Bishop. Um, they, 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 they were the um, pathfinders, really, in, in for allowing women to express their themselves internally and sort of opened opened the floodgates. And I just think um, it's it's I, I I don't know because I because I obviously there's I there's a lot of men of male poets I absolutely adore, but I was brought brought up very much that that is the canon of work: male white poets read male, especially old white male poets and then when uh, in the 1950s when when women started writing more poetry and I think it just allowed women to to, to express themselves um which they're probably obviously doing I mean it, it it's interesting because the poetry of the um first world war and second world war is all you know volumes and volumes of men but but there are just as many women poets who wrote in the first world <laughs> second world war but you know but their work isn't um you, you don't hear about their work so much, um, mm. but uh, I think it is something about having um, an inner voice um, that has been suppressed. Yeah, and they haven't been allowed to express themselves, and that now they can. Do you feel 
that, um, you know, now that you're talking about that and, and women expressing themselves, do you feel different vulnerabilities in each art form? Or, you know, how do you think that your, say, your painting expresses a different essence of you to your poetry? Well, both come, both come from quite an academic uh, premise. So I will work as hard on a painting, research and getting it right, the backstory to a painting, the title of the painting. Um, so they, they all come from that sort of language. But it's through the expression, isn't it, really? So through the art, it's through um, the imagery and the, and the colours and how you express yourself through transferring it through um, images, the colour tones and how, that re how the viewer reacts to that and how you emotionally connect to a painting. For me, it's about colour. I, I don't know about you, but to me, colour is everything. If I go into a to choose you know, clothes or anything or anything you know in the house it will all, it'll always be the color first if i don't like the color then i can't make it work um and then th uh, through poetry it's it's rhythm and imagery so going back to the influences of um pop music when i was a, a child i think that i think it's totally underrated i really do think pop music um is as as an influence on adolescence is really underrated as, as a really seminal influence it really influenced me I go back to those songs or even current songs you know and it's the rhythm and the way the words are mirrored by the rhythm and that's what I try to achieve in poetry a a a, a, a rhythm alongside the words and I, and it's so it would be the same in painting whether it be image mm. alongside the color that's a wonderful description of your work I love it um <laughs> what do you think drives you to create um, it's innate, really. I think. I think it's. I think it really. I think for women, particularly, there will there will be periods where when I, when I didn't, although I would have had this internal monologue going on, um, where I would have a creative brain, but not necessarily the time and space to be able to to create it. Um, it's about uh, that's the unfortunate thing for women, isn't it? It is down to to, uh, to timing. But now, but it, it does become addictive if you're lucky enough to be able to get on a roll and have the time to express yourself and to meet other creative people who really, you know, inspire you and um, and who are really, really supportive. It just becomes sort of innate. You you just sort of carry carry on doing it. It is part of you. Mm. Um, and I'm not and. Um, I'm not a professional painter. I mean, I do sell my work, but I'm not a professional painter. I haven't given up my day job to become a to become a, a painter, and not and and not many people do. You know, quite few, few and far between professional artists who are living solely on their art. So it's not mm. sort of money that's driving me. It's it's being being a creative person. <laughs> I love it. What are you What are you hoping to show people through your words and your paintings? My my experiences, I think, of growing up in a particular time with particular influences, and do you know, I think childhood and adolescence gets forgotten. I think we we grow up, we become tough, tough exteriors. We 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 have to we have to be role models. We have to, um, in, you know. Be steady, be calm, earn money, and and but the most important influence on you will be your own childhood and your own adolescence, and don't forget that because that's where you started. And if you want to to be a creative person, just remember that person you were when you were eight, twelve, fifteen. Um, what, what 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 did that what did that person want? What 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 made that person happy? And what would that and, and where would that person like to be now? And I think I felt a certain amount of um, guilt, really, that I wasn't um, I wasn't fulfilling my potential, that I wasn't doing what I knew that I had been encouraged to do as a child. And a lot of people go full circle, you know, they they they, they have a daily grind and what have you, but then they become happier when they go back to the things that made them happy when they were a child or um, a teenager. <laughs> why do you think then you know on the basis of what you've just said why do you think we need art in our lives because obviously a lot of us want art or we want to be creative but why do you think we need it and what do you think it teaches us 
It's a language, you know, it really is. And just, it's another language. It's another way of expressing yourself when, or when you, not, not, even if you're not a creative person, if you go to a gallery or you go to, to anywhere that, where there are, is art displayed, it's another language. You, you might be struck, struggling with, 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 um, thoughts and experiences. And then somebody will have, will just have done something that you just emotionally connect to. And it's such a lovely feeling when you see a great work of art. Um, it just uplifts you. It really is uplifting and it's really good for your, good for your soul. And it's, um, and we've always, humans have always been artistic and it's just, and it, 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 it it's, it's fundamental really in our lives. I think it's another language, another way of expressing ourselves. So. What do you think you've learned about yourself through being an artist and a poet? And how do you think it's helped with things like mental health, for instance? I think it's um, it's taught me the truth about myself. I think it really has. It's taught me, um, uh, it has taught me the truth about myself and it's validated uh, what I always believed of myself. Um, it's, it's quite... A, it's it's quite difficult because the end <laughs> the end product is not always what you set out to be, and I'm not the end product. Isn't always that good. <laughs> That's when you shove in the roof space. But um, <laughs> but it's it, it it's the truth about knowing that that is the way that I, that I and I'm, and I am happy to express myself that way, um, uh, and that. And that, it doesn't, like I was saying before, you know, and when you say about bad art, it, it, it doesn't matter. It just is the truth that that is the way I'm happiest expressing my emotions. It's so nice to hear someone say it's an expression of their truth. <laughs> <laughs> Good. It's, um, <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it, 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 it absolutely is. And it, um, in terms of how, mental health and well-being, it's the toughest thing you can do. <laughs> I think probably sitting, meditating and doing yoga might be far more, <laughs> less difficult <laughs> than trying to create something out of your head. But when you've done it, and just the process of doing it, I mean, I don't know if you watch, you know, portrait artists of the year or anything like that. Um, you know, if, well, when you watch people painting, it looks absolutely wonderful. It's so calming, but I know what's going on in their heads. Absolute blind panic. But um, <laughs> it, it, it's. Um, but when you're doing it, you do go into a zone. There is a moment when you go into a zone, and and time passes, and you are just you know hours go by, and you do get when it's going well, you go into this wonderful zone. Amazing. Oh, you're selling it to me. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to ask you a weird question. I always love the answer to okay. this question. So if you were to die tomorrow and be reincarnated, what three things, skills or memories would you want to take with you into the next life? Well, I'm a child of the 60s and 70s. And, you know, I think the best skill is is love. It really is. It's, it's, it's what drives us. It's what makes us happy. Um, it's a skill, it's a really a tough skill to learn how to love yourself and how to love other people in a sort of unconditional way. And all the memories I have are of being loved, of, um, being a loved child and being, um, and, and being, you know, long, happy marriage. Now that can be quite difficult for people who are not in that situation, but I do think it's something that, as humans, we strive for. And if we can take love with us wherever we are, and if we can go, you know, reincarnated as a better, a, a more loving person, build more memories of love. And that I think that comes out in this, you know, the, the current situation we're in now, doesn't it? That people are learning to be kind and to be to, to, to love each other and support each other and, um, and communities come together, and that's love. <laughs> It sounds like you're going to be reincarnated as the Dalai Lama. I'm happy with that. <laughs> I think, well, you think <laughs> Can he paint? Does he write poetry? <laughs> <laughs> <I'd be all laughs> <right. laughs> if you 
you were to go back in time and meet your younger self, what would you say to them? And what advice would you give them? I'd say, you look absolutely fabulous. What you were, <laughs> what you were in about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so really, really caught up. Stop worrying about your image. Stop worrying about what other people think of you. Um, de- de- definitely be, be, be your own, be your own person. I was very, um, I had a lot of confidence in myself as an artist, but I wasn't very confident around female friendships. I didn't have many female friendships. And um, and I think I would say now, stop being so suspicious and just trust people more. I just didn't trust. I didn't have a very good, um, a lot of trust for other females. And I think that's growing up in an all-female household except for my dad um, and um, going to an all-girls school. And then, and, and, and all those tensions that you get, um, female relationships. And I just, um, and I just think I should, you know, just make more, you know, make, make more friends, Becky. <laughs> trust, <laughs> trust people more. Stop gravitating to the boys all the time. <laughs> You sound like a very typical artist, darling. (laughs) 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 What do you think your proudest moments are? Well, obviously the, you know, usual, (laughs) my children and, and, um, and, and a long, happy marriage and, um, gaining a, a lot of academic achievement much later in life. So I was 40 before I got my degree. Um, and that was personal to me, and you know, not everybody has to go and get a degree. But for me, it was it was an unfulfilled p- potential. Um, so I got my degree and I went on to do an MA. And um, so th- I was really proud of that because I brought up my children. I made quite a a decision when I was quite young, when my children were quite young, that I would I would prioritise them, and 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 that what because I was young, I had that space. So I said, right, you know, I'll bring up the kids and they've and but we'll do the best we can with them and then it will be my turn and I did and I, and I achieved that so I'm, I'm, I'm really proud of that uh, artistically um, I, I do sell my work and I have won a few a couple of awards one of my paintings was shortlisted for the Royal Academy summer exhibition and on the back of that what do you think has been your bravest moment I think for me put uh, like I said before putting um, putting my family first before my own personal ambition um which was the right thing at that at at that at that time but um it was it was really quite brave because I think I could have if I put myself first at that point it could be catastrophic really in terms of um not prioritizing what I needed to prioritize for my family at that point um my dad, although he was an artist, he was a uh, and and very supportive of me. He was very egocentric, and everything revolved around him. And he um, and he found it really difficult to. Uh, he was really supportive of me, but it was almost like that. You know, like I said about school, there couldn't really be two artists in the family. Um, it wasn't anything to do with me being female or anything like that. He just couldn't. Um, he didn't have the strength really to support me as well. And um, and I remember making the decision that if I was going to get anywhere, I couldn't depend on him really to to. Um, I'd have to do it on my own, and I have to become my own person, and not rely on my on on my my father and my mother. And I was quite young then, because like I said, I had my children quite um, quite quite uh, when I when I was quite young. But um, and then I think that then, then another brave moment was when I actually decided. Well, actually, I'm, we can all you, you can pick over a scab for uh, and, and the things that have happened to you. Uh, all day long and 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 the bad things have happened the bad experiences but there does come a point where you need to really start looking at how you reclaim the good bits in your life and that and then I decided right okay my my dad wasn't a particularly supportive and wonderful dad um in, in, in those terms I couldn't rely on him but there were some really good bits in our childhood and growing up in that creative childhood so I asked permission of my sisters because we had all been impacted by my dad and I said how would you feel about me now starting to go back over what how we grew up and reclaiming 
some of the good bits because my sisters are, um, I don't know about you, but when you're in a big family, people don't tend to think you all think the same and do the same and feel the same and we didn't we all had very different experiences and my experience of of my parents would not be the same as one of my sister's experiences and I didn't want them to feel that I was sort of saying oh everything's wonderful you know my life is absolutely brilliant growing up (laughs) in a creative family and they um and I so I said is it okay you know if I go back and start reclaiming some of it as our heritage and I said yeah yeah go for it so I um so I put on an exhibition of my dad's pottery locally just to raise sort of pro- the profile of the sort of cult- cultural heritage that he was involved in. And I think I could have s- sat back, you know, and um, and 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 just sort of um, said, well, you know, he, yes, he was good. He was good. He was a professional writer and he made money and what have you, but he was a rubbish dad. So therefore that, that outweighs anything that he did but um he was our father and 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 my mom as well you know and I think that was quite brave really because I think I could have um I I think I could have missed a trick there (laughs) I think it helped (laughs) do you know it's such a funny thing isn't it because obviously in this day and age there are a lot of artists um, especially musicians that are you know being sued by people for things that they've done 20 Mm. or 30 Mm. years ago Mm. ago. and I think Mm. sometimes it's really hard for us to separate the art from the artist and and as you've rightly said you know just because he wasn't the best dad doesn't mean that his work needs to go unseen or uncelebrated and I think that is that's Mm. probably the bravest Mm. thing that anyone can do Mm. so Mm. I think that's one of my favorite bravest moments on the show so far (laughs) i love it (laughs) It, it, i I mean you're you're right though you know it's 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 such a difficult argument separating the artist from their art and i do err on the side of um you do separate them otherwise galleries would not have half the art in them that they do um uh, it, it's it's really really tricky because you've got to be really sensitive to any any victims of anything that's that's happened. Um, I just think um, I just think you just have to be brave and reclaim what you can in mm. for the positive. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. Yeah, and things you know things get lost in history because of that. Um, yeah. If people aren't brave yeah. enough to, you know, yeah. put it out there anyway, yeah. Yeah. Uh, everyone's going to have an opinion on it, yeah. regardless of whether the the artist was a saint or a sinner. Mm. And uh, yeah. and it's just like we were saying earlier about, you know, that being a vessel for the arts. Sometimes the art just chooses the vessel, and that vessel might not be perfect, but their hands or their mind might make yeah. the art perfect. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then people will create more on the back of that. And then that would inspire a whole new story that would move forward instead of sort of digging a great big hole and burying stuff. Allow the people, the people who, you know, I just find it quite frustrating sometimes that, um, that, 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 that it's like a, it's like a full stop and people aren't, aren't, aren't allowed aren't allowed back in yeah and and it's so tricky especially for you know artists that have become artists posthumously and you know when people start to dig back into history and and they see what type of person that was I mean where does the judgment and the justice and the you know the redemption where where does the line stop um so on the back of that you know what what advice would you give to those thinking about making it as an artist <laughs> don't do it um <laughs> the, i think it's around what really does come down to your ambition and your com- your commitment and why you are making that co- co- commitment so if you want to be a professional artist and you want to make money, you're you're going to have to compromise at some point, and 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 a huge huge compromises. And if you're happy with those, if you're happy with a gallery taking fifty percent commission, um, you know, and 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 it's just a financial market really, um, but you know, driven by money. Well, well, absolutely fine, absolutely fine, but. You might not get to that point, and you might be sort of just down on the on the lower levels, but like me, really, you know, and just sort of selling a bit of art, but really connecting with people and really having an emotional connection with people and having people come and look at your work. And I'm not saying every, <laughs> I've had some quite challenging 
episodes of my art. Not everybody gets it, but you've got to have to, you have to be really, really clear, um, what, what, why you're producing the art that you are, what, what you want from it. And do you want to sell it commercially? And if you don't, you're going to have to be really happy just having it like me, stacks and stacks of canvases in your studio. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I feel you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. But it's a, it, 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 it is a, it's a tough one. Yeah, it is a tough one. But, you know, that's why it's so important to create in the first place, I think, because, you know, regardless of whether you become a famous artist or not, as you've rightly said, the art needs to exist. It's a language. It's speaking to people on maybe a level that, yeah. you know, some yeah. people can't speak mm -hmm. uh, and they're not extrovert. And it's a way of them expressing themselves in a way that maybe someone might understand or yeah. connect with, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, I think, you know, it, it, there's, it, there's an awful lot of snobbery around it, isn't there? And there are terrible art snobs. Um, and, uh, and, I've, and, I, and I'm guilty of that sometimes, you know. And we, 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 don't get waylaid by that, you know. It's, uh, if, if, you're, if somebody buys it or... or um, it's a contract between you and, and that person. And, and it's a contract between the person who stands in front of your work and really likes mm. it. Um, and that's good enough sometimes. You don't have to, money doesn't have to pass hands. Yeah. Um, and it's, it, it is that it, emotional, emotional connection. Sometimes that currency is enough. <laughs> so we're coming to the end of the interview and I'm so sad because it's been such a pleasure to talk to you and delve into your world. So your final question, before I ask you to read another piece of poetry for us, is what advice would you want to give to the world right now, if it would listen? It, it, I think just um, keep a balance. Just just keep a balance and um, and and try and um, and th 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 there's good and bad and let them both influence each other. You're not going to get rid of either. Um, but at the end of it, take a big step back and, and get some get some balance and just keep listening to um, like Hunky Dory by David Bowie or something. That'd be quite <laughs> <laughs> I love that your answer is yeah. listen to David Bowie. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you heard it here first, That'll listeners. That on. is the cure. <laughs> so, Becky, it's been so wonderful to have you. Will you please leave us with one of your wonderful poems? Oh, yes. Thank you very much. Yes, I will write, uh, I will read a poem. Um, it's called First Old Paints, 1966, uh, based on the first time my dad took me down to buy oil paints. First Oil Paints. 1966. My father's hand, roughed up by turps and oily rags, pilots me through the, the harbour art shop. Windsor Newton lexography, dusty powder, coral rose, he recites. I say, will it taste like pink, icing, marshmallow, smell like sweets, my first oil painting? He recites cerulean, cobalt blue and green. And I say, will it taste of salt and picnic hard-boiled eggs, smell like seaweed on the breeze? My father says, Becky, that's what talent is. Oh, I love it. I want to give you a clap. <laughs> 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 thank you so so much that was beautiful oh Pleasure. I love it so if people have if people have enjoyed your interview today where can they find you um I have a website www.beckynussell.com and I'm also on Facebook Instagram and Twitter fabulous thank you so much Becky <laughs> thank hopefully you, we'll Kat. speak to you again in person at some point <laughs> okay thank you Kat bye I love how Becky plays with the themes surrounding female identity. From her collection, Before We Became Women, We Were Girls, to the female empowerment explored in her new exhibition, Chasing Rainbows, her connection to her own growth as a woman is undeniable. I love that after being a mother, she reclaimed her name and role as artist. Sometimes we can get stuck with labels that we may have outgrown or aren't who we really are on the inside. 
Becky proves that she is more than one archetype and more than one label. She is sister, mother, artist, poet, teacher, storyteller and much, much more. She was not afraid to reclaim her power for herself from an egocentric father and instead of feeling burdened by her emotion, she exhibited his art, reclaiming the space and in the process closing a cycle. I love the way that she is curious and adventurous in her themes surrounding the female archetypes, providing deep and philosophical approaches to presenting the feminine icon that is tangible for all. Becky believes that all art is good art, and it's something that we've heard from many artists that have come on the show. That no matter what you produce, as long as it is true and expressive of who you really are, then it is worthy of the space and that you shouldn't go into it to necessarily make money, but to define your success by touching people's souls instead so that they can recognise the truth in themselves. So as we come to the end of a very strange year, take time to reflect on what you've learned about yourself. Lean into the dark and take time to write down your thoughts and experiences of the pandemic, the lockdowns, the time you've had in your home, in your environment and with your family, and see if you can write a poem, draw or make something to signify your existence this year. Recently, thanks to a future guest's online art club, I managed to draw my first self-portrait. I looked like a sort of vampire in it, but nonetheless, it will be stuck in my 2020 journal, along with all the other things I've learnt or tried this year. If you're lucky enough to be with your family for the holidays, take a ton of pictures, bake a cake, make a tree decoration and cherish the moments to express in some way for all to appreciate the memories collected in 2020. But above all, be kind to yourself. Be creative, dream big dreams for the coming year and remember what Aristotle once said, the aim of art is not to represent the outward appearance of things, but the inward significance. And I think we can all agree that this year has meant something significant to all of us inside our hearts and minds. Happy holidays, everyone, and I'll meet you all again next year. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to the show. If you have a spare moment now, please like, subscribe and tell me your thoughts in a review, which will really help other people like yourself to find the show. Of course, you can also share with your friends and follow us at the Brave Moment Podcast 2020 on Instagram or the Brave Moment Podcast on Facebook. If you're interested in getting in touch, pop on over to the therapy page Coping to Mastery on Facebook or via the website copingtomastery.org. It's been so wonderful to have you all here with me again. Please get in touch with the show with your own stories. And don't forget, your brave moment starts now.